Welcome everyone and, and thanks for joining. Uh, my name is, is Roy Ozeri and I'm the Vice President for Development and Communications at uh, the Weizmann Institute. Um, so um, we thought that it will be great to come back uh, to the topic of COVID and hold another seminar for all the friends of the Weizmann Institute uh, worldwide. You know, the last two years, all of us have been uh, occupied very heavily with COVID. Uh, Weizmann Institute was no difference. Um, in the last two, three months, I mean, the entire world and Weizmann Institute included, went through the Omicron wave. Uh, this was a huge wave uh, all over. Uh, here at the Weizmann Institute, we had very high infectious uh, infection rates, um, close to 30 infections a day. Um, I myself uh, got infected um, and spent a few days in quarantine at home uh, with, with, uh, with COVID. So even though the number of infections on campus during this Omicron uh, wave integrated was much higher than the infections, all the, all the total infections we had throughout the previous uh, two years, the Weizmann Institute hasn't stopped. Um, and I think that the reason for that is that uh, I think all around the world and in Israel in particular, it was very clear that the Omicron uh, disease was not as dangerous and, and not as severe as the previous waves uh, of COVID. And that's why the restrictions we had on campus were not as severe and uh, the activity on campus did not slow, did not slow to a halt. I have to say that both in Israel as well as the Weizmann uh, almost all restrictions are, are over. I think that besides wearing a mask, uh, practically we don't have any restrictions. Conferences are back, gatherings are back. All scientists receive invitations to, uh, to travel to conferences abroad. Uh, we we went back to organizes, organizing conferences on campus. And really the atmosphere here is that, and the feeling is that uh, COVID is behind us. And I think that this is, while this is the feeling, it's very difficult to judge whether this is a psychological effect of, of you know, people having a feeling that every, the worst is behind us and we're back to normal um, and we're facing another, another, uh, another mutation, another variant that would flip the coin back again and we'll be back to restrictions or this is, an actual epidemiological fact, and you know this this whole COVID episode is behind us, and this is the reason why we thought of of inviting Professor Gabi Barabash, um, who has already held several uh, such seminars, uh, in particular at the beginning of the epidemic, um, to bring uh, Weizmann friends uh, knowledge and facts about this uh, this epi epidemi epidemiology to come back to us and, and maybe try to lighten our eyes with respect to the, uh, to the situation that we're facing now. So with this, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Professor Barabash. Gabi Barabash is an MD and MPH, is the Director General Emeritus of Israel's Ministry of Health and the Director of Weizmann Institute's Bench to Bedside, Bedside Program, which brings together scientists and physicians studying and developing therapies and other solutions to the disease. He's a professor of epidemiology and preventive medicine at the Sackler School of Medicine at Tel Aviv University, and was formerly the CEO of Tel Aviv Sukarski Medical Center, also known as the Ichilov Hospital. Uh, so since the pandemic began, anyone in Israel who have seen uh, the news broadcast of Channel 12 has seen Gabi frequently uh, bringing knowledge to the Israeli public um, and and uh, I think Gabi's uh, contribution to the to the way that Israel uh, has coped with the disease is is invaluable. So uh, thank you very much, Gabi, for for uh, for be willing to to come here and speak with us tonight. You're invited to submit your questions in the chat or to the email vip.visits at weitzman.ac.il. And following Gabi's presentation, Tamar Levine, who is the head of our resource development department, will run the Q&A session with Gabi. So with that, Gabi, please, the virtual floor is yours. So thank you, Roy. Uh, 
for inviting me. Um, with the declining pandemic, I am kind of screen deprivation. So it's good that I have another screen. Uh, in my short talk today, I will discuss uh, three topics. First, I'll begin with what we call the COVID enigma. Then some of the lessons that we have learned here in Israel during the Delta and Omicron waves. And finally, where are we heading? So let's start with the COVID enigma, what I call COVID enigma. We are two years into the pandemic and we still do not understand why some people don't get infected despite being exposed to the virus. How can we explain a married couple that live together, eat together, and even sleep together? The husband is sick, going into ventilation for two months with three resuscitation, and the wife is completely healthy. Well, there are two potential explanations for that. One is genetic protection against infection, as we also see in other, uh, some other infectious diseases. Actually, there were about 20 genes that already were identified that kind of defend against uh, corona infection. But there, there is another possibility, which is cross immunity from the other four endemic human coronaviruses that stimulated some long-term immunity or immune memory in a way this cross immunity is also our hope for the resolution of the COVID pandemic. And we will return to this positive note at the end of my talk. Now, let's discuss now Israel experience with the vaccines and the booster. Evidently, pandemic management has changed dramatically before and after the introduction of vaccines. There is no question that vaccines are our only way out of this pandemic. Of all the COVID prevention measures that we have at our disposal, vaccines are far and away the most effective at reducing the risk of hospitalization and death. Now, let's elaborate a little about the Delta wave dilemma and the role of boosters in its resolution in Israel. When the Delta wave arrived, uh, we were not sure about the balance between Delta variant resistance to the vaccine and the waning of vaccine immunity. Which of these was more dominant? Indeed, in the beginning of the Delta wave, we saw many breakthrough infections among vaccinated people. This raised the suspicion of variant resistance of, to the vaccine. And this is something that we were worried about since the beginning of the pandemic. However, given that the most, uh, you know, most of our population at that time had been vaccinated, it was expected that vaccinated people will also have a higher representation among the infected individuals. However, when we started analyzing the correlation between the risk of being infected with the timing of the initial vaccination, we started seeing an interesting picture. There was a clear correlation between probability of being infected by the Delta variant and the time that has elapsed since the second vaccine dose. This was a revolutionary observation coming from Israel. While we all knew and we estimated that the vaccine will be effective for a limited time, no one thought it would be as short as a few months. US public health officials uh, didn't believe this initial impression from Israel. I was part of the team that analyzed the data. I remember I had argument about this with Tazax, then the chief medical officer of Moderna. And I remember one Saturday in July, waiting for Shabbat to end to let Bennett know we received the final definitive results that proved that it was not the Delta resistance, but the waning immunity and that we should deliver the third booster. We would be the first in the world to do so. There is no question that the third booster vaccine saved Israel from a disaster associated with the Delta wave. 
It is worth mentioning though, that recently we observed the same winning immunity of also the third booster with regard to the Omicron wave. Israel healthcare system, its four HMOs and their excellent clinical databases won worldwide recognition for this expedited clinical observation. By now, we are all aware of the two characteristics of the Omicron variant. Firstly, it is highly transmissible and therefore spread very fast. Secondly, it is associated with less severe disease, fewer hospitalizations, and lower mortality. However, despite these observations, I am not sure that the Omicron variant is indeed significantly less virulent as compared with the previous ones. Two recent studies estimated that Omicron was about 70, 75% as likely as Delta variant to cause hospitalization of an unvaccinated person with no history of COVID infection. This means that the Omicron variant causes similar intrinsic disease severity as previous variants. I believe that the observed reduction in Omicron's virulence stems from its greater ability to infect people with pre-existing immunity, which protect them against severe disease. We recently witnessed a worldwide steady takeover of the new Omicron subvariant PA2. Based on places like the UK, South Africa, Denmark, where there is an increasing proportion of PA2, <coughs> I do not think we are going to have a significant BA2 driven outbreak. The BA2 variant may slow the decline in infection, but not dramatically. One more point I wish to raise regards the question I am being asked quite often lately. <clears throat> what if, sorry, <clears throat> what is the implication of a positive antigen test after the required quarantine period of five to seven days? it is important to understand that not like the PCR test, which may occur, may, which may occur long time after COVID infection because of viral remnants in the upper airways, positive antigen tests may indicate that you are still potentially infecting others. Indeed, there is accumulating evidence recently that infectious period of the Omicron variant is longer than the five to seven days of the formally required quarantine. And finally, I would like to emphasize again one critical fact or truth. Nearly two, two years into the pandemic, the unvaccinated are still making up the majority of COVID deaths. Only a small percentage of deaths are among fully vaccinated and boosted people who are either older or have pre-existing conditions that increase their risk of dying. So here I concluded what I wanted to tell you about the past. Now we are reaching the more riskier part of my talk. Where are we heading? So obviously, clearly, we cannot eradicate the COVID virus. It is too widespread and our vaccines are evidently imperfect shields against it. Also, there is no question we will see new variants. Now, is there a reason to think that the next variant will also produce less severe disease like the Omicron, or is it wishful thinking? The answer, I think, is yes. But let me explain why. Firstly, I'd like to share with you a recent analysis of the last few days we ran, we ran here in Israel. So. Here you can see uh, the, the, the uh, number of new infections or the number of total infections per each of the waves that we experience in Israel. You have the last three, which are Alpha, Delta already with name and Omicron, which is the higher, uh, bigger wave. May we see the next slide? And then you can see where we put the vaccines in the third wave and then the booster 
uh, in the middle of the delta wave. And now let's look what happens with mortality rates in those three, uh, uh, in those five waves. So you can see that the first wave, which was an, a small number of, of uh, infections, but the mortality was close to 2%. Already in the second wave, it went down to uh, 1%, and then down, down, down to, till the Omicron, where you have 0.08% mortality. Now, I have to draw your attention that there, is a, there are here two opposing uh, con uh, biases, because firstly, for sure, the number on, of infections was higher than what we uh, counted. And on the other hand, we haven't seen all the deaths that are related to the Omicron wave. So these two opposing biases are kind of balancing each other. Clearly, you can see that the mortality rate is going down across the different waves. Now, what are the explanations for that? For sure, vaccine has an impact here, but also better understanding of the pathogenesis of the corona disease with understanding what is the immune system contribution there and the treatment with steroids, which changed dramatically the outcome of those patients. You can take out this slide now, please. So now, but, but there is an additional factor that we have to take into account when we uh, try to understand why the mortality is going down. And I think we have gained some degree of protection against new variants, and we may have less severe disease from now on. This protection comes from the continuing increasing population immunity, resulting from either vaccination or infection. This is very similar to our experience with COVID's more distant evolutionary cousins, the four other seasonal or flu coronaviruses, which we have all gotten and not really cared about. These flu coronavariants are far older than the COVID variant, and they have been circulating for centuries. We believe that at some point in history, these four flu variants or viruses invaded populations and initially caused devastation before reaching what we call a state of equilibrium with the population. Now they are endemic and infect most people when they are young, causing mostly mild infection. So, to sum up, I am cautiously optimistic that at some point this COVID-19 will also behave or evolve in a way that is similar to the seasonal coronaviruses, which are endemic. And finally, I think that corona-wise, excluding Ukraine, this spring will look a lot better than the winter. Thank you. <laughs>